Welcome back to World History Explored. All right, when you hear the words history and Great Britain, your mind probably jumps straight to Vikings and all those awesome tales about kings and cutlery, right? But what if I told you there's more to it than that? Imagine diving deep into the entire history of Great Britain, from its earliest days right up to Brexit. A whole world of fascinating stories and events is waiting to be explored beyond what you might expect. So let's dive into it. Let's start with 800 BC, when the Iron Age kicked off and the Britons, or Celtic Britons, were holding it down in England. They were the main crew, along with a few smaller ethnic groups, keeping things interesting on the island. These Celtic folks were the real deal, sticking around from the Iron Age through the Middle Ages until the Germanic Anglo-Saxons crashed the party. Over time, the Celtic Britons split into different groups like the Welsh, Cornish, and Breton, but they still shared a language, religion, and culture, keeping their roots alive. They spoke Britonic, which laid the grounds for modern Britonic languages. By this point, the Atlantic trade system had taken a nosedive, but England kept in touch with France, adopting some of the Hallstatt culture vibes. While England wasn't seeing as much action in terms of population movement, hill forts were popping up left and right, especially on the south. Things got centralized, with some forts becoming real hotspots. History started to take notice around this time, with mentions of Britain popping up in old texts. Dudes like Pythias of Massilia were sailing over and giving us the lowdown on the island life, mentioning the locals rolling into battle in chariots, just like the heroes of old. There were a couple of invasions to spice things up, with groups from Gaul swooping in to shake up East Yorkshire and the Belgae staking their claim in the south. But these weren't total takeovers, they were more like elite crews setting up shop on top of what was already there, bringing some new flavor to the mix. Then, Julius Caesar decided to crash the party in 55 and 54 BC, swinging by during his Gaul campaigns. While he didn't set up shop permanently, his visits marked a big shift. Suddenly, everyone in southern Britain was eyeing Rome, seeing it as the ultimate plug for trade, wealth, and status. It was only a matter of time before Rome became the big player in town. After Julius Caesar's brief visits, the Romans decided it was time to make a real go of conquering Britain in AD 43, under Emperor Claudius. They rolled in with a serious squad, landing in Kent with four legions and taking on the kings of the Catuvalani tribe, Caraticus and Togodumnus. They had some epic battles at the Medway and the Tame, with Togodumnus biting the dust and Caraticus making a run for it to Wales. The Romans weren't messing around, they took control of most of the southeastern chunk of England, setting up shop with Camulodunum, modern Colchester, as their capital. Over the next few years, they expanded their turf, with future Emperor Vespasian even heading down south to show two more tribes who was boss. By AD 54, they pushed the borders back to the Severn and the Trent, with plans in motion to take over northern England and Wales. But in AD 60, the tribes had had enough, Led by the warrior Queen Bodicea, they rebelled against their Roman overlords. At first, they were on fire, literally, burning down Camulodunum, Londimium, and Vermilamium, modern-day Colchester, London, and St. Albans. But the Romans weren't about to roll over. They regrouped under Governor Suetonius Paulinus and brought the pain. In the end, Bodicea and her crew were utterly defeated, with tens of thousands of rebels meeting their end. Over the next couple of decades, the Romans expanded their borders a bit more, with Governor Agricola even taking a swing at Scotland. But eventually they settled into a groove, solidifying their hold with Hadrian's Wall in AD 138, despite a few skirmishes up north. The Romans ruled England for a solid 350 years, leaving their mark all over the place. Then came the Anglo-Saxon era. As Roman rule crumbled in the 4th century, Germanic groups like the Angles, Saxons, and Jutes started rolling in, setting up shop in what would become England. The Battle of Diorum in 577 was a turning point, establishing Anglo-Saxon rule. The exact nature of these invasions is still up for debate, with some thinking they gradually integrated with the locals, while others believe they booted them out. Seven kingdoms emerged from this Anglo-Saxon migration, each with its own vibe. Eventually, Wessex rose to the top, flexing its muscles over the rest. But the process wasn't the same everywhere. 
Some areas saw mass migration, while others had more of a slow takeover vibe. The period of the Hepturchy refers to the time in Anglo-Saxon England when the land was divided into seven kingdoms, Northumbria, Mercia, Kent, East Anglia, Essex, Sussex, and Wessex. These kingdoms were not always stable entities, and power often shifted between them due to succession crises, warfare, and alliances. During this time, Christianity began to spread in Anglo-Saxon England, influenced by both Celtic Christianity from the Northwest and the Roman Catholic Church from the Southeast. Christianization gained momentum with the arrival of Augustine, the first Archbishop of Canterbury in 597 AD. He baptized the first Christian Anglo-Saxon king, Ethelbert of Kent, in 601 AD. Over the following decades, Christian missionaries continued to convert the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, and by the mid-7th century, Christianity had become the dominant religion in most of England. The last pagan Anglo-Saxon king, Penda of Mercia, died in 655 AD, marking the end of pagan rule in England. The Christianization process also extended beyond England's borders, with the Anglo-Saxon mission on the continent leading to the conversion of much of the Frankish Empire by the 8th century AD. This period saw the rise and fall of various Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, with Mercia emerging as a dominant power during the 8th century under kings like Ethelbald and Offa. However, the rise of Wessex, challenges from smaller kingdoms, and Viking invasions eventually brought an end to the Hepturchy and Mercian supremacy by the early 9th century. The Viking Age brought significant challenges to England, with Viking raids and invasions disrupting the political and social landscape. The first recorded Viking raid in England took place in 787 AD, and subsequent attacks, such as the raid on Lindisfarne in 793 AD, marked the beginning of a period of conflict between the Anglo-Saxons and the Vikings. Despite initial successes in repelling Viking incursions, England faced further invasions and internal struggles, leading to the rise of powerful rulers like Alfred the Great of Wessex, who played a crucial role in defending England against Viking attacks. The Norman Conquest of 1066 marked another pivotal moment in English history, leading to the establishment of Norman rule under William the Conqueror. The conquest brought significant changes to England's political, social, and cultural landscape, including the introduction of Norman feudalism, the imposition of Norman French as the language of the aristocracy, and the compilation of the Domesday Book to survey land ownership and taxation. Overall, the period of the Heptarchy and the Christianization laid the foundations for the development of medieval England, setting the stage for subsequent events such as the Viking Age, the Norman Conquest, and the Wars of the Roses. The Tudor period in England, spanning over 118 years, was marked by significant political, economic, and religious changes. It began with Henry VII's accession to the throne in 1485, ending the War of the Roses. So way back before England and Scotland joined forces, they were doing their own thing. Then in 1496, King Henry VII of England saw what Spain and Portugal were up to with all that exploration, and he wanted in on the action. So he sent this guy named John Cabot to find a shortcut to Asia through the North Atlantic. Cabot set sail in 1497, just a few years after Columbus did his thing, and ended up landing on what he thought was Asia, but was Newfoundland. He didn't stick around to start a colony or anything, though. Cabot went on another voyage the next year, but never made it back. No one knows what happened to him or his ship. So after Cabot's little adventure in 1497, England took a bit of a breather from the whole let's colonize the Americas thing. It wasn't until Queen Elizabeth I rocked the throne in the late 16th century that they started getting serious about it again. But hold up, before we get into that, let's rewind. In 1533, old King Henry VIII decided to flex his muscles and declare England an empire with his fancy statute in restraint of appeals. Pretty bold move, right? Now, around this time, things between England and Spain were heating up like a rivalry between two sports teams. Why? Well, blame it on the religious drama of the Protestant Reformation. England was all about that Protestant life, while Spain was firmly planted in the Catholic camp. Cue the drama. Fast forward to 1562. 
Queen Elizabeth I is on the throne and she's got some tricks up her royal sleeve. She decides to give a couple of dudes named John Hawkins and Francis Drake the green light to wreak some havoc. Their mission? Raid Spanish and Portuguese ships off the coast of West Africa. And what were they after? Slaves. Yeah, it's not the noblest pursuit, but hey, it was the 16th century and things were a bit rough around the edges. Now you'd think Spain would just let these shenanigans slide, but oh no, they weren't having it. The Anglo-Spanish Wars kicked into high gear, and Elizabeth was all like, you go privateers, keep raiding those Spanish ports and snagging their treasure. It was like a high-stakes game of cat and mouse on the high seas. To sum it up, England took a hiatus from colonizing until Elizabeth I came along and stirred up some trouble with Spain. Privateers were unleashed, raiding and plundering, all in the name of expanding English power and riches. And thus, the stage was set for the next chapter in the epic saga of English colonization in the Americas. Exciting stuff, right? Now, while all this drama was unfolding on the high seas, back on land, some influential folks were cooking up big ideas. We're talking about people like Richard Hackloyd and John Dee, who were like the hype men for England's imperial dreams. They were waving the flag and shouting, let's build our own empire. Spain was flexing its muscles all over the Americas. Portugal was setting up shop from Africa to China, and France was cozying up along the St. Lawrence River, gearing up to become New France. It was like a game of global chess, and England didn't want to be left out of the action. John Dee, in his infinite wisdom, even coined the term British Empire before it was cool. These guys saw what the other big players were doing and thought, hey, we want a piece of that pie too. So while Spain was busy dominating the Americas and France was staking its claim up north, England's dream team of thinkers was scheming up ways to carve out their own slice of the world. It was like a race to see who could plant their flag the furthest and claim the most territory. And let me tell you, things were about to get even more interesting on the global stage. Back in the 16th century, while Portugal, Spain and France were busy building their empires, England was a bit slow off the mark. But hey, better late than never, right? So they decided to dip their toes into the colonization game with what's known as the Munster Plantations in Ireland. They sent a bunch of Protestant settlers from England and Wales over to Ireland to stake their claim. This wasn't England's first rodeo in Ireland, though. They had taken a piece of the pie after the Norman invasion in 1169. In the late 1500s, Queen Elizabeth I grants Humphrey Gilbert permission to explore and colonize. Although his initial attempts fail, Gilbert's half-brother, Walter Raleigh, continues the effort. Raleigh establishes the Roanoke Colony in present-day North Carolina, but it fails due to a lack of supplies. In 1603, James VI of Scotland becomes James I of England and signs the Treaty of London with Spain, shifting England's focus from raiding colonies to establishing its own. This marks the beginning of the First British Empire, characterized by colonization efforts in North America and the Caribbean. England's early colonization attempts faced challenges, with ventures in Guyana and the Caribbean failing. However, in 1607, Captain John Smith founds Jamestown in Virginia, the first permanent English settlement in the Americas. Other colonies follow, including Bermuda, Maryland, Rhode Island, Connecticut, and the acquisition of New Netherland, renamed New York in 1664. The British West Indies, particularly Barbados, becomes a focal point of England's colonial empire due to the Sugar Revolution in the mid-17th century. Massive sugarcane plantations, fueled by African slaves and Dutch merchants, lead to unprecedented wealth and trade in the Caribbean. To maintain control and profit, Parliament passes laws restricting trade to English ships only, sparking conflicts with the Dutch, such as the Anglo-Dutch Wars. England annexes Jamaica from the Spanish in 1655, colonizes the Bahamas in 1666, and establishes the Hudson's Bay Company in 1670 for the fur trade in North America. However, this colonial expansion comes with a dark side, the transatlantic slave trade. England becomes deeply involved, with forts along the West African coast facilitating the shipment of enslaved Africans to the Americas. This trade becomes integral to British economic life, despite its inhumane consequences. From 1700 to 1850, 
Britain's global influence and military prowess were showcased through its involvement in 137 wars or rebellions. The Royal Navy, supported by a small standing army, played a crucial role in maintaining Britain's status as a major power. To finance its military endeavors, the government shifted towards relying on customs and excise taxes, eventually implementing an income tax after 1790. This rise in taxation, amounting to 20% of national income, fueled economic growth and stimulated the industrial sector, particularly in naval supplies, munitions and textiles, bolstering Britain's advantage in international trade. The French Revolution in the 1790s polarized British society, with conservatives vehemently opposing its principles and actions. Britain's involvement in wars against France from 1793 to 1815, including the Napoleonic Wars, defined much of its foreign policy during this period. Despite facing challenges on the continental front, Britain emerged victorious, culminating in the final defeat of Napoleon at Waterloo in 1815. The loss of the 13 colonies prompted a shift in Britain's imperial ambitions towards Asia, the Pacific, and Africa. Adam Smith's ideas on free trade further influenced British policy, emphasizing economic prosperity over territorial expansion. The British East India Company played a pivotal role in expanding British control in India, laying the foundation for a vast empire. Despite setbacks such as the War of 1812 with the US, Britain's economic and military strength remained formidable. By mobilizing its industrial and financial resources, Britain successfully navigated through turbulent times, emerging as a dominant global power by the mid-19th century. In 1922, a significant political shift occurred with 26 counties in Ireland seceding to form the Irish Free State. Northern Ireland chose to remain part of the UK, marking a critical moment in the island's history. Forces of reform, rooted in evangelical religious movements, began reshaping British society. Political reform expanded the electorate and embraced free trade, laying the groundwork for continued societal evolution and economic openness. Remarkable political leaders such as Palmerston, Disraeli, Gladstone and Salisbury shaped the nation's trajectory during the 19th century. Culturally, the Victorian era epitomized prosperity and middle-class values, coinciding with Britain's economic dominance and a relatively peaceful century spanning from 1815 to 1914. During World War I, from 1914 to 1918, the United Kingdom played a significant role as one of the leading Allied powers. Their main adversary was Germany, a central power. The UK significantly expanded and reorganized its armed forces during this time, including the establishment of the Royal Air Force, in January 1916, conscription was introduced for the first time in British history, following the formation of one of the largest all-volunteer armies known as Kitchener's Army, consisting of over two million men. The outbreak of war brought a sense of unity to British society, despite existing tensions within labor, suffrage movements, and especially in Ireland. Many sacrifices were made to support the war effort, with both fighters and non-combatants contributing to philanthropic causes. The government enacted legislation like the Defense of the Realm Act 1914 to address potential shortages and labor issues. Under Prime Minister H. H. Asquith, there was a shift from normalcy to total war, with complete state intervention in public affairs under David Lloyd George by 1917, a concept unprecedented in British history. The war also saw the first aerial bombings on British cities. Newspapers played a crucial role in rallying public support for the war through propaganda efforts directed by government officials and influential figures in the media. The wartime economy experienced significant growth and adaptation, with increased production and the entrance of women into the workforce. While the war is often associated with advancements in women's rights, its impact varied greatly depending on factors such as location, age, marital status, and occupation. The war brought about hardships, including food shortages and the Spanish flu pandemic in 1918, leading to a rise in civilian deaths. Military casualties exceeded 850,000. 
20 years later, when the United Kingdom declared war on Nazi Germany in September 1939 to kick off World War II, it had control over various crown colonies, protectorates, and India to varying extents. Additionally, it maintained strong political connections with four of the five independent dominions, Australia, Canada, South Africa, and New Zealand, as co-members with the UK of the then British Commonwealth. In 1939, the British Empire and the Commonwealth collectively held significant global influence, with direct or indirect political and economic dominance over a quarter of the world's population and around 30% of its land mass. The contribution of the British Empire and Commonwealth in terms of manpower and resources played a pivotal role in the Allied war effort. From September 1939 to mid-1942, the UK led Allied endeavors in multiple theaters of war worldwide. Commonwealth, Colonial and Imperial Indian forces, totaling nearly 15 million serving individuals, engaged in combat against German, Italian, Japanese and other Axis forces across various continents and oceans. Commonwealth forces stationed in Britain fought to impede Axis advancements in northwestern Europe, while Commonwealth air forces battled the Luftwaffe above Britain. Commonwealth armies achieved victories against Italian forces in East Africa and North Africa and took control of several overseas colonies of German-occupied European nations. Following successful campaigns against Axis forces, Commonwealth troops occupied territories such as Libya, Italian Somaliland, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Iceland, the Faroe Islands, and Madagascar. Over three years, the Commonwealth forces managed to thwart, delay, or contain the Axis powers while mobilizing their integrated economy, military, and industrial infrastructure to construct the most extensive military apparatus of the war by 1942. However, these efforts came at a significant cost, including 150,000 military deaths, 400,000 wounded, 100,000 prisoners, over 300,000 civilian casualties, and substantial losses in warships, submarines, aircraft, tanks, and vehicles. Despite these sacrifices, the Commonwealth expanded its military and industrial capabilities considerably. As the United States entered the war in December 1941, coordination between the Commonwealth and the U.S. intensified, with joint military efforts and resource sharing. The U.S. gradually assumed command in many theaters, allowing Commonwealth forces to focus on other areas. Nevertheless, defending far-flung colonies and Commonwealth nations from simultaneous Axis attacks proved challenging due to disagreements over priorities, objectives, and deployment of joint forces. Although the British Empire emerged as one of the primary victors of the war, reclaiming lost colonial territories, it suffered significant financial, military, and logistical strains. The United States surpassed the British Empire as a global superpower, reducing Britain's role in international politics. Additionally, nationalist sentiments in British colonies, particularly in Africa and Asia, were ignited by the war, leading to the gradual dismantling of the British Empire through decolonization in the latter half of the 20th century. England, as part of the UK, became a member of the European Economic Community in 1973, which later evolved into the European Union in 1993. However, in 2020, the UK withdrew from the EU. There's a movement within England advocating for the establishment of a devolved English Parliament, similar to those already existing for Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Wales. This issue is commonly known as the West Lothian Question. In terms of political history and local governance, significant reforms have taken place over the years. In 1969, a Royal Commission recommended a system of single-tier unitary authorities for England, but the subsequent Conservative government favored a two-tier structure. The Local Government Act of 1972 brought about significant changes, abolishing previous administrative districts and establishing a uniform two-tier system across the country. However, this system lasted only 12 years as Metropolitan County Councils and Greater London were abolished in 1986. 
Subsequent reforms, including the establishment of unitary authorities, aim to balance efficiency and cost-effectiveness while maintaining effective governance. In 1997, the Lieutenancies Act separated local authority areas from the concept of counties as high-level spatial units, establishing ceremonial counties. Despite devolution of power to Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, plans for a devolved assembly or parliament for England were not realized, with only a London assembly being established. Recent changes in 2009 saw the creation of new unitary authorities, consolidating functions previously held by county and district councils. Additionally, regional development agencies were abolished and local enterprise partnerships were established to promote economic growth and development at the local level. However, the pivotal moment came with the Brexit referendum in 2016, which ultimately resulted in the UK's departure from the European Union in 2020, signifying a significant realignment in its economic and political trajectory. And that's a wrap for today's video. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll catch you in the next one. Drop your suggestions for what you want to see next down in the comments. If you enjoyed this voyage through time, please like, subscribe, and click the notification bell to join us for more explorations into the fascinating histories of the world, right here on World History Explored.